Okay, good. All right, so this, is a, this session is all about Flex.js, which is Flex for JavaScript. And the, uh, the takeaway from this session is that Flex is not just for making Flash apps anymore. All right, the agenda is pretty simple. The who, the why, the what, the when, the how. Um, so who? Who am I? My name's Alex Harui. I'm a Flex committer and PMC member. I've been doing software development for more than 30 years. I've been at Adobe Systems for almost 12. I've been working on Flex SDK pretty much the entire time from Flex 1.0 and on through all the releases since. And then I moved with it to Apache. Um, and I'm currently serving as the Apache Flex PMC chair. All right, so we have this Flex SDK. Lots of people use it, build some amazing apps with it. So why another thing? Well, this Flex.js was created because, you know, while Adobe Flash Player used to run in essentially every browser in the world, it's no longer true. Um, there's a lot of devices now that have browsers that, that don't run Flash. And while Adobe Air used to run on most computers in the, back in the day, that's no longer true either, right? There's a lot of platforms, a little, especially the devices and tablets that Air does not run on, Windows, variants of Windows Phone and uh, Palm and so on. And then even at Adobe, we're finding that the executive stack, the executives in your, in your larger corporations may not be carrying Flash-capable devices anymore. And so if you want to involve them in, the, in the, some sort of workflow, um, your choices are you know, to take a Flex app and, and uh, turn it into an Air app and then install it on their, on their device. But then you have to do the, get their device from them to do the installation because they're not going to do it themselves. And if you need an upgrade, you've got to get it from them again. And they'll get annoyed if you push an update to them and they get that upgrade dialog, right? And then even, and even then, Air apps on, on these mobile devices have some fidelity issues around um, how well they kind of work with the native input devices. And so, so there's some issues there. So, um, uh, so that was another need, you know. So how can we solve this problem better for people who want to get their executives involved in, the, in these uh, workflows? Um, and then a lot of people have large MXML and ActionScript code bases, and they're like, well, gee, you know, I need to get this app to work on some place that Flash doesn't run. How can we do that, right? Which of the bazillion uh, JS frameworks should I be thinking about porting to? And wow, how am I going to port this much code without killing myself and, my, you know, and our developers and doing it? And then finally, um, uh, one of the uh, complaints we heard sometimes from mobile uh, app developers who are building these flex apps that went through the pipeline through uh, Air and create these uh, native apps for, for Android and iOS is that the, the framework was heavy, it was made for bigger packages than they would like, and, and may not have performed well as they would like. So, uh, you know, there was a desire to make a lighter framework for, for our mobile uh, app developers. So, what is this thing called Flex.js? It's a total rewrite um, of, of, of the Flex SDK, but um, it, it, the basic promise is that we're going to allow you to use MXML and ActionScript as you know it uh, to create either Swifts that run Flash, Air, or HTML, JS, and CSS files that will run <coughs> browsers or anywhere that the stuff runs without Flash. Um, we're setting a bar around IE8. Right? We're not going to deal with IE6 and IE7, but IE8 we get a little bit of enough of compatibility, and then 9, 10, 11 get better. Um, and we're going to support Chrome and, and uh, Firefox, Android, and iOS browsers. And we should be able to support mobile apps uh, via Apache Cordova. Now, there are several ways we could have done this. And so um, and I'm, I'm going to go into uh, discussions of these ways and then uh, talk about why we chose the, the last one. So the first one was we could emulate the Flash player. right? We could just say, hey, if we create a Flash player that can interpret Swifts, then you wouldn't have to, to change anything if, uh, um, you know, if um, uh, or if you could recompile everything and it, it created this output JavaScript and then we had the same Flash Player API surface, then we could emulate the whole player in JavaScript, right? So that's one way. Um, another is to emulate the current Apache Flex SDK, which is just to say whatever APIs are available in MX and Spark components, uh, we would create those equivalents in, in, uh, in uh, JavaScript and, and try to get your app to run that way. Um, and then there's just a total rewrite. So. Um, so if we did this emulation, yeah, it would be great because you wouldn't have to re rewrite any of your code, right? Your code would just run. Um, but that is a lot of work. And, 
and you know, with especially in Apache communities being volunteer driven, there was sort of an impractical thing to try to take on. And even if we could get it to work, in the end, you're running, you're running code that's running through an emulation. You're basically trying to write a virtual machine in, in the browser to run something. And so if you try to compare that against a natively written JavaScript app, you're kind of going to lose that battle almost every time. And, and we're pretty sure that performance is always going to be an issue for these kinds of apps. Um, and then there's the fidelity issue around, you know, would we actually be able to get all those nuances of Flash Player to work in the browser, especially IE8, right? Um, but some people have tried to do that. There's a, 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 a thing called JuFlash that the Jangaroo people have done that does some amount of Flash Player emulation. Uh, there's another project called Dart Flash. I haven't looked recently to see what it's doing, but another person trying to do emulation of, of uh, Flash Player. But we decided not to take on that direction. Um, so short of that, we could have said, well, let's just do the Flex SDK, right? Just emulate all of that. Um, and then you'd only have to change code where you went down to the low-level Flash APIs, like if you had blend modes and filters in your app or you tweaked the, the hand cursor um, property and some other properties in the Flash APIs. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of possible, but then you're still going to run into some other issues where, you know, ActionScript and, and the Flash Player runtime supported these entities like weak references and dictionaries and, and uh, E4X, which is the... Um, ECMAScript uh, query for uh, XML and the ability to embed assets and stuff like that, that, that uh, would be a lot of code to try to emulate if you could do it all in JavaScript. And the performance of that would probably be bad as well. Um, so, um, and then uh, the other thing about the current Flex SDK is it's sort of monolithic. It's, it's, it's got lo very large classes, and those classes uh, have a lot of other class interdependencies. And so, you know, if you, even if you just write hello world, you end up with the, with the collections uh, API into your Swift anyway, because it's, it's all intertwined together, right? And, and so, um, and so there, you know, if we did all of this perfectly, your, your net output for your JavaScript would be much bigger than you probably need, right? So it's like, all right, maybe we won't do that, but in fact, one, at least one person in our community still wants to try it, right? So, you know, they'll try it and we'll see how far they get, and, and you know, maybe they will work great. Um, but I'm I'm hoping that there's this sort of middle ground between that angle and the Flex JS angle that will get 50% of the APIs, the ones that are clean, to work, the, the ones that are probably the most popular, and those those will be the ones uh, that'll be the end up being the library that we choose. So not by emulating anything, we decided the best thing to do is to rewrite it from scratch because we want to write, um, we want to write an SDK that is designed to be cross-compiled. <clears throat> you know, if, that's the, if that's your main goal, then, that, then your output will be, uh, have higher fidelity and better performance, right? And so in this new framework, in the, in the ActionScript code we write that's going to run in Flash, we try not to use ActionScript and Flash features that are hard to implement in JavaScript. So we're not going to use weak references um, in, in the code that needs to, to have the same feature represented on the other side. Uh, we won't, you know, we're not relying on embedded assets and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And we're discouraging the use of XML uh, web services and telling people you probably better luck going to JSON, right? Because JSON does work on both platforms. And then we're doing other things as well. We've got new coding patterns that are more about plugins and composition than about these monolithic cl uh, cl uh, classes. And uh, the early uh, evidence is that that's going to net us better for performance. It certainly, you'll see in the, in the demo that it nets smaller uh, Swifts and smaller JavaScript uh, output. Um, and it has this other benefit that, uh, that by you know, making sure you have good separation of concerns around all these little pieces, that you create little nuggets that a volunteer community can more easily take on, right? If I ask someone, hey, in your spare time after your, your long, hard day of work, would you like to try to make some change in the 13,000 line base class? They're going to go, oh, geez, I know, right? But if, if, if the thing that you want can be added as a little plug-in that plugs in, then you kind of know that, that you couldn't have really screwed up anything else in the framework by adding it. So um, this plug-in thing, you know, gets us some performance and some other benefits, but also is, is there 
as a practical matter to try to make it easier for volunteers to help build this thing out of tiny little pieces. All right, so it's a rewrite. Um, it's, it, uh, uh, it's designed you know, to be cross-compiled. It's not having all the ActionScript and Flashisms in it, so therefore, it can't be 100% backwards compatible, right? And that's a bummer. But on the other hand, you know, if you look at it this way, if you had an, an existing application, 10,000 lines of MXML, 100,000 lines of ActionScript, and you've got to run it someplace Flash doesn't run, well, you could port 110,000 lines of code to something else, or you can port much less of it and hopefully get your core business logic, which is really the thing that's really important to you, right? The presentation layer, you can kind of probably muck with that a little bit more, but the core business logic will hopefully, if you've got good separation of that, will come over pretty much intact, right? And then it'll get cross-compiled out to JavaScript, and you'll have a pretty good feeling like that's gonna still work, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's sort of our, our game. We're saying, yeah, you gotta kind of meet us somewhere along the line. We can't go and, and, and do everything for you so that you don't have any work to do. Um, and so in that same vein, you know, people say, well, you know, how much work is it really gonna be? You know, well, uh, it's hard to say. You know, here's, you know, on the next slide I have some metrics for it, but here's another thing to think about, right? Uh, if you, even if we don't have it, like for XML, like we're not gonna do E4X, right? because you can't take some XML and do a.b.c to get the properties out of it. Well, you're gonna to have to rewrite that anyway, because that doesn't exist. If you had to go to JavaScript, you're gonna to have to find another way, right? So that doesn't count in our, in our total of how much you had to port. You were gonna to have to port that part anyway, right? So uh, one team that I worked with, they had, you know, their back end was using uh, XML, and they said, oh yeah, well we actually have a JSON API anyway, because the guys who were prototyping the, the the, 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 some, the, some HTML JS version of it was, you know, Angular, Backbone, whatever they were trying, needed JSON APIs anyhow, right? So, okay, so they went to their code base and said, yeah, if we just change these three ActionScript classes, right, because they take their XML and they create data objects out of it anyway, right? So they just could take uh, JSON, they create data objects out of it anyway, and the rest of all their code files didn't care about it, right? So they got, you know, Couple files changed, boom, all that's working. And then the rest of it could go through the mill and come out the other side uh, without it being touched. And that's a much more comforting feeling if you're trying to do this kind of porting. So, um, so to the question, how much can you reuse? It's always gonna be an it depends kind of answer. Um, we're saying to the extent you've, your application is really just MXML widgets glued together with ActionScript code, you have a pretty good chance, right? The more you depended on Flash APIs for stuff, like if you wrote a game, Right, and the game you know, had clouds filtered and fog over this whole thing and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not what we're really focused on here. We're really focused on the business apps, right, which aren't gonna do bizarre twists and turns and 3D rotation of their combo boxes. There's this dialogue, you know, it's gonna look nice to be branded and all that stuff, but here's your dialogue, let's get the data, turn it back to the server, get the next data, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and you know, if you, if you need video, there'll be video. There's, you know, there's HTML video, but if you need flash quality video for some reason, well, we're not gonna have that right away. Um, well, maybe we'll find a way you know, that you can write the rest of it in HTML and, and then the video object will still be flash, right? But that's still not gonna work in the places that flash doesn't run. Um, and then, you know, if you are relying on the text layout framework to do document presentation, uh, that's possible, but we don't have that right now because that's a huge library that needs to be ported over. It should be doable because fundamentally TLF uh, is a ton of ActionScript code that says I'm gonna take these flash text widgets and place them so theoretically those flash text widgets could be, placed, be replaced with divs or spans that we could place, right? So it's doable, but it's not high on our list right now. So. Not, not, we're not tuned at this early stage for those sort of document-centric kinds of applications. It really is form fillers and, that, and uh, data presenters, because there'll you know, be chart libraries and, and data grids and so on. And then so you can go back to your code base, you can search for import flash. That'll give you a good idea of where you went below the flex layers and went down, down the flash directly. And you can search for the word embed, to see how many assets you're embedding, kind of say, hmm, you know, is that really important to us, or is it okay if these if these assets pop in late? Um, 
and it gives you a good idea. Hopefully, you'll find that most of your Flash imports may be for importing Flash events, like you need to enter frame or, or, or add child or something like that. Um, and those are pretty easy to emulate, right? Or just replace them with something else. But it's, it's, it's if you use filters, blend modes, transforms, you know, that kind of stuff, that's where it's going to get hard. If you have a question, you can jump in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how these, well, the slide decks are up on the Linux site, right? So you definitely get the slide deck down, right? Um, uh, so but, but what we're, you know, so it's going to be MXML Action Script with, with as many of the MXML constructs that people know and love about Flex, though. So there'll be data binding. Uh, you can use your curly braces and tie things together. Um, hopefully data binding will actually be better uh, in, in FlexJS than it was in, um, in uh, the Flex SDK because we, we're going to apply a little more intelligence to how the binding gets set up. And we should be able to optimize binding in many situations. Um, and then uh, this thing called states, which is the ability to declare a set of, of view states or or you know, like if you think of your UI as a state machine, you can say, you know, I've got the login state, and then I've got the data presentation state, and I've got the data verification state, and then you can declare certain UI components and other things that show up and disappear and properties that change based on those states. Uh, that stuff's going to come over, so you can still, you know, use the XML that uses states, um, and then the component names will be pretty much the same. Uh, we'll have buttons and labels and, and uh, drop-down lists and data grids and all that stuff. Um, some of the APIs will change around them a little bit because, as you'll see later, we're, we're kind of we're working backwards from JavaScript, right? And so it's, it'll be better in some ways. Like, like all the text, all the things that display text have both an HTML and a text property, right? Because you can put HTML in and it'll show up on JavaScript in the browser, right? So we will do that too. Um, and that way, if you need to get underline or something like that, you know, it's relatively easy to do, whereas the current flex components are pretty much plain text oriented for the most part. Um, and, but some things had, do have to change, and uh, one of the things that we're changing is the skinning model. There will still be skinning, um, but it'll be different because, again, we're, we're kind of working with what uh, uh, is, is going to be efficient to do in the browser, right? And the way browsers work is they have HTML elements that you can't skin, right? And then you have backgrounds that are bitmaps or SVG vectors that you can change. And so uh, the, and then styles, right? Styles change a lot of the actual visuals. And so the, 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 the skinning of FlexJS apps will be set up primarily along those lines. You'll be able to set the background image or, or so on and, 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 and set styles. The, the composition of the subcomponent tree is called a view, so you can still change that, but they're separate entities, whereas in, in the current flex, they're, they're uh, all in the <coughs> place. Uh, we hope to have SVG vector scanning support where the browsers support SVG well. Um, so that may be a problem on IE8, but if you don't need IE8 support, or you want to roll out the, the Swift version for IE8, and you can promise that all the other browsers are going to be HTML5 and SVG client, then you might be able to do that. And when, um, it's still in progress. The one uh, committer is trying to see if the F FXG output that the, the Adobe tools can create uh, can be used uh, efficiently on the ActionScript side, and then we'll cross-compile that to, to SVG and be used on the JavaScript side. So you still be able to get vector, uh, the benefits of vector skinning uh, for your visuals if you need it. Um, uh, for now, the application object is not a display object. One of the things that was good about Flex is that you could pull up one file, you could dump all your stuff in there and, and get an app out in one file, but it caused you to, to sort of intertwine your business logic with your view logic a lot, and that's not so good. So um, we're going to try to get people to work from templates where an application template wants you to have a, a first view and a model and a controller and kind of wire all those together separately. And it makes it easier to cross compile the thing, too, because topologically, um, applications, if you think about it, the application tag in MXML is going to roughly map, not directly, but roughly map to the HTML tag in an HTML file, right? And the first view is going to roughly map to the body, right? So it, the, the, you know, the, the HTML tag isn't a UI tag. 
per se, it's not a parent of UI, right, in, in an HTML world. So that's why we're, why we're kind of setting up that way. Um, and then we're going to have uh, support for multiple component sets. We tried in, in the old SDK, in the, in the Flex SDK, we tried to have this one button that was the button that everybody used. Um, but that button, I looked the other day, it has 124 public properties on it. And that means there's a lot of code running around inside that, you know, sort of just in case. And so we're going to have different buttons. Um, there's, there's buttons that show text, buttons that don't, know, don't show text, so that the ones that don't show text that show up in the up, down arrows of scroll bars and so on don't have to think about whether they have a text uh, widget or an icon to display right there. They just display their skin. <coughs> and then um, there will be multiple component sets. <coughs> Sorry. Let me get some water here. See if that's better. Better, okay. So there'll be multiple component sets in the sense that um, uh, you can choose to have uh, buttons uh, and other widgets that map directly to uh, these JavaScript widgets that we're writing, but you'll also be able to pick a library of buttons and widgets that are going to map directly to jQuery buttons and widgets or uh, any other, back, uh, any other uh, JavaScript framework that someone chooses to wrap. They can present uh, a Swift version for your prototyping or your deployment where you can deploy Swifts, and then where you can't, you will get what are, um, the UI created on whatever um, platform you, or uh, framework you really want. All right, demo time. So, um, so th I think the thing that will make or break Flex.js is really about productivity, uh, developer productivity. The, this is the thing that I think that drew people to Flash and Flex in the first place, right? Um, there's an IDE, uh, you know, the, 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 there's code hinting, code intelligence as you're typing and so on. So here's Flash Builder, and um, it's got uh, a Flex.js SDK installed as the SDK for the project. Um, and so we're going to look at the how, how it works uh, in terms of source code. So here's the, the main application, and it will look like an application. It's got an application tag. Um, it's got some initial event handlers. Uh, here are the, the basic templates. It needs um, a CSS implementation because simple apps don't need complex CSS, which is expensive to compute. So um, we're going to have a simple uh, implementation. Here's the initial view. Here's the initial model. Here's the initial controller. And here's an HTTP service, which um, is dealing with a collection that's going to map. The service is going to take its information and shove it into this collection which is going to use a, a, a JSON input parser to create uh, this, uh, these uh, stock data items, right? So this, this LL application is going to go and let you pick from a list of, of stocks and, uh, um, and then show you the price of the stock. So in the, um, uh, our model has slots for uh, the field to ask for, uh, uh, and you can see we've got bindable stuff in there, right? And then, uh, uh, the basic set of, of stock tickers that we're going to be able to fetch. Um, the controller logic is in here. It, it's doing, um, it's listening for events from the view, right? Button click, uh, click, and list change, and then it does the right thing, eventually making a, uh, um, uh, a service call here, right? It's calls to send on the service, sets up the URL, and sends out to get the data. Um, and here's the view, right? The, um, the view looks like your typical MXML. It's got a top tag. It's got event handlers. It's got a script block. Uh, it's got bindable tags. Uh, here's your event handlers in here. It's got custom styles, right? Uh, here's the states. It's got a hide and show stage for some extra data. Uh, and then here's a container with a vertical layout um, and you know labels, uh, text inputs, buttons, more labels, and so on. Drop down list, rate of buttons, checkbox, right, and so on, right? And so this works um, just like Flash Builder does today. If I uh, you know, make a mistake on something and, and hit save, it's going to go catch me in the problems pane and, and tell me that um, you know, there's, a, there's a bug there and I've got to go fix it. Right? So I get all that, all that productivity um, uh, you know, it, down in the MXML. It's going to show me uh, code completion uh, here right? if I 
hit space, code completion for all the possible <coughs> properties that I want to put on these tags, right? So all that productivity is, is happening right in front of your eyes. And every time I hit save, instead of running the old SDKs compiler, it's actually running this new compiler called Falcon, um, which knows how to take this uh, information and create a Swift out of it, right? But the key thing is that along the way, it's building the syntax tree that the cross compiler will eventually be able to, to leverage to create the JS site. So, and then I can um, set breakpoints in my code. Uh, let's see, I got a handler here. And you know, instead of having to go to Firebug and set up breakpoints away from your code, right? I can set up a, um, a breakpoint here. And then when I run the app in the debugger, um, you know, it's, it's, it's running it uh, just like a normal Flex app. And then, um, you know, here it is, right? I can, I can uh, pick a, a stock. I can go out, yeah, I'm on the internet, so I can go out and get the price of Google, right? Um, I can click this on and off to show more information about Google. That's flipping through the view state, right? The binding showed that as I changed this, uh, you know, picked a different one. And then as I, as I click through there, I changed the radio button. It stopped on this breakpoint. I can step through um, my code. I can, you know, check my variables, run expressions, and so on, right? So the whole thing, it's the whole productivity suite around Flex. Um, I knew I was going to miss something. screen there. Okay, so um, uh, so um, but now that I have it all working, right, and I've debugged it and you know and I feel pretty good about it because the action script runtime is also checked, right? It's also checked that all my contracts with the APIs are all are all good, right? Assuming that I've put other tools on the code coverage on my code, right? Now it's time to say, all right, let me see the JavaScript version of it, right? So I go over here and I've plugged in this extra tool. Oh, it's over here. And this is now running the cross compiler. And so um, it's taking all this code uh, and it's, it's finding my um, flash builder settings. And it's now basically taking all the MXML files and creating JavaScript files for it, right? So the, the data binding test, the model, the control, and the, and the view are all being turned into JavaScript code. And then all the framework SWICs that are used underneath, right, the checkbox and the service and all that stuff, that's bound up as a SWIC. And those are not being cross-compiled because it's assuming that if it's a, it, in a SWIC, then it's in a library and there's a JavaScript library substitution for it on the other side, okay? And so it's been told somewhere up here, uh, the, JS, the SDK JS lib, it says, go look in here for any class that was in a SWIC, go look in there for a JavaScript class of the same path and package name, right? And then bring that in. And all this goes through the Google Closure Compiler, um, which is cranking on it right now. There it goes. And it's building, it's going through the Google Closure Compiler to create the minified JS version of it. And in a minute here, it takes a little while to crank through it. Um, it will, uh, and you know, we're looking for people to help us optimize this tool chain, right? Because it's a little slower than I'd like it to be. Um, but um, in a minute here, it'll have, it'll have kicked out the, the final version. There it is. So then over in, uh, in Finder, I can go find uh, my, uh, my workspace. No, it's Flex Demos workspace. That's right. Demos workspace and data binding test, it is output into the bin directory um, uh, 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 a release version and a debug version. The debug version has all the files in a pretty readable format so you can put it through Firebug or the browser debuggers and see what's going on. And the release version um, has a, a source map so you can do debugging of the minified version if there's some optimization problem. Um, along the way though, I'm gonna show you one other thing which is that the, the, the browser version is it still running? Yeah, the browser version it has a Swift that's um, that is um, 66K with data binding states, right, and a data service in it, and a collection in it. And 
the, the equivalent of that in, uh, and that's the debug swift, the release swift, about half that size, and the equivalent of that in the current SDK is like 500K, I think, right? So these swifts are much smaller, so they're gonna load much faster and run much faster. Okay, so over here in, uh, in this land is, is uh, you know, the, the wrapper is called index.html. Now here is the same thing. This is the same app, right? Same code base, cross-compiled. And to prove it to you, right, I can right-click on it and there's no Flash Player thing, right? And so here's, here's the, 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 the ActionScript version and here's the, uh, the, uh, the non-ActionScript version, right? And they look pretty close and we've got some work around tuning it up because we want things to kind of line up even more tightly than they do now. But hey, it's functional, right? Pick the stock, get the quote, there it is, right? The states work, right? Let's show it off. The data binding works. It's all in there. Pretty cool, huh? Um, and then I can go one step further, right? Because I have this, this uh, uh, file of, of, of stuff here, right? Actually, I'm going to use the debug version of this for now. But so, so you can see there's, there's JS files for everything here. Um, I can go one step further, which is to, um, to run uh, uh, this, uh, let's see, I gotta go to, uh, and let's see if it's still in the uh, command history, so I don't have to type the whole thing. Here it is. So we have an ant script that we provided in the SDK that's gonna take all the stuff and convert it into a Cordova project. Okay, so theoretically, it's going to take my data binding test out of the flex demos folder and convert it into there and see if it'll actually do it. And so, this is basically just an ant script calling Cordova CLI, right? It says if you went to the Cordova demos, you saw that that's a uh, that's a, an easy, you know, friendly way to build up your your uh, project. So create a project. It's taking the the the, the www files the, or the 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 JavaScript and HTML files from uh, the output directory Flash Builder and copying it over to um, Cordova's folder and running Cordova's uh, build tools on it, right? And so eventually it will output uh, <coughs> something. And while that's running, I'm going to get a different window up and run the screen share. I have my phone plug, plugged into my computer, right? And then, uh, let's see, get out of mail. And there's Droid screen is up. And let's go and look for my phone. And there's my phone. And then, uh, are we done here yet? Still building. Um, and again, you know, volunteers would be helpful here to try to optimize some of this as well. Um, let's see if I can turn off. Oh, it's just going to be slow. All right. Can I get over here? Turn off my, uh, turn off my virus checker, see if that helps it. took off again. No. I don't know why machine's slow today. Maybe I should have waited to turn on the screen thing until afterwards. that run while we continue on. So, um, uh, so there's prototypes available now. Uh, you can go on the dev list and find out you know, where to get the prototypes from. And we should be getting an alpha quality release out soon. I'm, ho I'm hoping to actually post the release candidates when I get back. Uh, so under the covers, let's see, I've got 20 minutes, is that right? No, 15 minutes, right? Yeah, 15. 15, right. So, um, Let's see if this thing's done yet. Yeah, okay, it's done. So then, um, so I go back to my uh, 
Cordova directory. Uh, and do uh, Cordova on Android. Let that think for a second here. So back to slides. So, so how does it work under the covers? Uh, like I said, we have new compilers, Falcon, Falcon JX. The MXML and ActionScript is cross-compiled to JavaScript. Swift classes are, are not cross-compiled. We look for JavaScript equivalent. All that uh, is, uh, and then uh, CSS, your, your CSS uh, gets copied over. Um, Non-standard CSS is turned into an ActionScript structure so that the uh, framework code that wants to handle non-standard CSS can handle it, because CSS doesn't get, um, gets ignored by the browser. And then we have a slightly different HTML wrapper. Are you done yet? Let's see, is it up? It is, and the screen share, there it is. Good. Same app, running on Android. I don't have my, I don't have an iOS set up, but, um, oh, gotta run it over here. Um, I could pick the stock. The binding worked, right, so on. And, you know, go over the network and get the thing, so it's one code base really running anywhere. If I had the right Cordova set up, Windows Phone, Palm, Blackberry, you know, all those things that they were listing. And um, uh, we have more work to do here, like, you know, we want to be able to swap out the drop-down list with a more mobile-friendly widget, right? And, you know, so we need to get the media query stuff working better and so on. And, and, uh, and, and things like that. But basically, one code base can take you just about anywhere now, right? And with the ability to get the de developer productivity out of having real classes, right? Because yeah, you can do all this with JavaScript and some JavaScript framework, but here, here are the classes and the IDE are really gonna help you out, right? It should be more productive. So under the covers, under the hood, you know, we got, like I said, we got a whole new code base we didn't try to refactor the current Flux SDK code base. It's too big, too intertwined. I actually tried doing that once uh, when I was at Adobe, and I, I gave up. It was just too hard. It was, you always end up bringing in stuff that you think, oh, that's too easy to bring it in, and you wish you hadn't brought it in. So it's time to just, sometimes you've got to dump everything out and start all over. Um, and we didn't, for the same reason, we're not copying too much from the current code base either. We copy a little bit about the binding and the way it works, but for the most part, we're not copying stuff in and throwing stuff out or, or building up from zero. Um, but the important thing is really that the JavaScript implementations influence the way we write our action script. And like I said, we, the, the text model in, in most of these widgets, even button, right, has an HTML property and a text property because if you want to set your HTML in there so that you have a little bit richer thing, you should be able to do that. It works just fine over there on JavaScript, so why not, right? Um, and so, we have this philosophy called browser first, where you know, we we're trying to use as much of the existing stuff as we can, not trying to write emulation layers or any of that stuff. So you know, whenever a component can be built out of built-in HTML components, we're gonna do it, right? So there's the button wraps the simple uh, HTML element, and text input does pretty much the same thing. Um, but even at higher levels, we don't haven't done this yet, but if there's a good functional data grid, right? We, in HTML5, we will emulate that in Flash Player so that you can write against that, and then when you cross-compile it, you're gonna get a native thing that runs well. Um, and so really, this is really the, the, the theme of the game is, you know, find the good thing that's working in JavaScript and then figure out the right, right way to present it as a, as a class in ActionScript, All right? Not the other way around. We're not, this is easy to do it this way in Flash, and now let's figure out how to do it in JavaScript. We're not trying to go that way. And that should result in the lowest overhead possible when you get out to the JavaScript side. Um, there's some other stuff that you kind of have to get. It's a little bit different mindset around, especially um, as, as a, uh, a framework developer for FlexJS. And I'll, I'll go over these in, in, in detail a little bit. So um, parallel frameworks, plugins, composition, over inheritance, multiple components, that's just in time, not just in case. And this last thing about rapid prototyping is important, which was, Really, one of the things I think that really made Flux successful is people were able to do that demo where you can kind of take a blank screen, type some code in, and get a working app in a few minutes and go show your manager, you know, in a couple of days that you have a proof of concept. 
But for me, I, I saw a lot of heartache at the back end where people were getting ready to ship and it wasn't running just as fast as they needed to. And then it was like, what do we do now, right? And it's like, well, you've you got these monolithic classes, you can't tear them apart and pull out stuff that you know you're not using. So we're focusing a lot on, on that this time. That, that you might have, you might take you a little bit longer to get your rapid prototype up, but the, the payoff will be at the end game when really you really care. You'll be able to throw out stuff you're not needing and try to optimize a little bit better. So, so really, the, the this thing about you know SWIC classes get replaced by JS classes is this concept we're calling parallel frameworks. Really, as a component developer, you're writing two components. So I'm writing a button.js and a button.js, right? And the button.js can use Flash APIs to do its thing. The button.js code is completely different, right? Because it might just create a, a built-in HTML element underneath and, and plug in some some wrapping JavaScript for it, right? But it presents the same API service, the same thing, click event and a label for a text button, right? Um, so, um, um, but then higher level things, though, like our data grid, for example, is actually really composited out of stuff. It's, it's a bunch of lists, it's all, all coordinated together, right? So that the JavaScript version is really just, uh, we're able to write data grid in, entirely in ActionScript and run through a cross compiler and get a functional data grid out the other side. But we want to go low where we can. So sometimes you're going to end up writing two, two things. Like, I think data grid column has an equivalent because we needed this other thing on the other side. Um, but all of that enables the, the application developer to write one set of code, right? And so that code, uh, you can compile it and debug it in, in Flash, and, you know, do all your testing in Flash, and then finally when you're ready to done, you, you can export it out to, uh, through the cross compiler. Um, and you know, there's some advantages to still having a Swift version. Uh, one is that we, you know, we, you can use the IDE um, for development, um, and, but it's all that developer productivity stuff, right? Um, the the action script is strongly typed, so you're going to find your mistakes early. The VM's going to check your your dynamic af, uh, aspects of your application, make sure that you're fulfilling your contracts, and then uh, finally, if you can deploy Flash. Uh, you're going to save yourself a whole lot of cross-browser testing. Just should save you a lot. Um, now, the, the plugin stuff that we're using um, is uh, something we're calling beads. So we're all these, like I said, we're going to all make all these little things that, that are usable. Um, I guess I got to kind of rush through this. So um, we've got uh, an example. Really, was we wrote this little prompt, right? So when you have uh, a text input, you kind of have a little gray text to tell you what to put in it sometimes, right? Well, um, in, the, in the current Flux SDK, we actually wrote that code three times. It's, it's, it's the code you copy that code is in text area, copy the code is in text input, copy this code is in combo box, because we didn't have a plugin mechanism, right? And so when I had to write that code and actually add it to those classes, I had to run a full regression suite on all the code in that class, right? Kind of wasteful, right? And if I fixed the bug there, I had to fix it in all the other three implementations. And so, you know, by starting off with the honest to God plugin architecture, we wrote text prompt once, and you could plug it in anywhere, including some other thing that I hadn't thought about, right? So um, that's one of the reasons for doing it. Um, another reason is that a lot of components are reused as subcomponent tree, right? And so like the uh, text input is used in a combo box, but when it's used in a combo box, the combo box has its own uh, frame around it, so why do you have text input thinking about laying out a border, right? So the text input has a different view bead which doesn't have a border in it when it's used in a comma box. So that's an optimization. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then allows us to deal with different platforms, right? So on, uh, uh, if you, every Flex mobile app today uh, is running mouse over, it has mouse over code in it. It has keyboard handling code in it, you know, for keyboard navigation, right? Up and down arrows and stuff like that, right? Well, we're going to toss that code. You know, we'll toss all the mouse handling code, replace it with touch code when you go write your mobile version. Um, now, uh, the, 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 uh, um, all the configuration of which beads you use in your app are, are done in CSS, so that it's, it's a sort of an external configuration. Um, and so you can, that way, you can use media query. Once we get it going, you'll be able to use media query to select different components, different skins, different views, 
for the various component trees to get it to reconfigure for the different runtime platform. And then whenever you find yourself using a certain set of beads over and over and over again, then you can wrap those into a, a top level component. But then you know those that code is baked in, right? Uh, now, um, composition is uh, about five minutes. All right. So composition, uh, the principle of composition is also again that reuse. So the more we reuse code, the the, the faster it runs. It turns out that flex apps actually take longer to start up with JIT off than they do with JIT on because there's a lot of run once code in starting it up. But we rewrote the way the the, the apps initialize, so that it's more data driven. It runs to this one engine to create all the widgets, and so you should get better performance that way. Um, and then I think I'll s well, let me see if I can get through this picture real quickly. Let the browser go. So um, so we wrote this. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues wrote this thing on our wiki page that kind of shows that that the um, Barely fitting. Okay, so that uh, that your your application has a view and a controller and a model, but even within it, right, the components themselves, like a button, has its own view, control, and model. So you can change out pieces of it at runtime, right? So this is all about composition. It's a hierarchy of, of things. All right. Flying through here, multiple component sets. Like I said, one size button works in many places, but not everywhere. Uh, so we're, we're going to make it so you can swap out whole component sets for versions that run on jQuery or the JSUI frameworks, um, or even pick ones that are just HTML5 dependent if you cannot use IE8 or, or older browsers. Um, uh, just in time, so like a lot of stuff in Flex today. Flex initializes managers that start up to deal with overlapping windows and tooltips and stuff like that, none of which are used in mobile apps. Again, those managers will come in if you need them, right? Even a pop-up manager you don't need unless you're doing overlapping floating windows. And so you won't need a pop-up manager in your apps either. And then uh, this last thing around prototyping and optimization is, um, you know, yeah, you've got more choices to make. You've got to choose your component sets. You've got to choose your beads. You've got to mix them all together. There's more typing going on. But in the end, it should still be pretty efficient. You've got an ID to support you. But in the end, after you get that running, it's time to go to production. And you say, oh, you know, that's too heavy, too slow. Oh, there's someone has a lighter implementation. You can swap in that lighter implementation. So that's really what we're trying to do. And we might even be able to write these debug mode beads, which have more parameter checking in them, so that while you're writing your code, you know, it'll tell you more about things that you're doing wrong, but you won't carry that weight around at runtime. Right? So having replaceable pieces of code I think um, is going to be uh, beneficial. So, uh, so we're getting ready for alpha, but we need all kinds of help in every phase of, of, of this project, from testing to development to documentation to examples. Um, but we're, you know, we're getting there, and FlexJS is going to be the thing that, that I think lets you use your investment in Flex code bases already in, in training in Flex and XML and ActionScript forever, without having to worry about what's going to happen with Flash, right? Because those browsers will run JavaScript forever. Um, and you'll be able to get your mobile apps out through Cordova. Uh, you'll be able to use these enterprise class languages and tools, tool chain, to build these, these things and feel better about them and, and have, I think, higher productivity. And then, you know, but the best way to make sure that happens is to get involved yourself. So uh, there's our main site and our mailing list. Um, there's a lot of traffic on our mailing list, but all the stuff uh, that pertains to FlexJS at this point in time is prefixed with this thing, so you can kind of filter out stuff. Because there's literally 100 emails a day, I think. And questions? Yes. Uh, there's a guy in the back for stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, so. Um, we have in, I don't have it with me, but in the, in the repo is, the, is a jQuery version. So uh, if you think about a jQuery button, for example, right, you know, I, I forget how you set it up in jQuery, but it really is a certain pattern of JavaScript code, right? And so you can, you can encapsulate that pattern in a, a JavaScript class, right, by creating some class called 
you know, button.js and you know, uh, maybe you know, jQuery.ui.button and propagate these APIs. Then you go right to the ActionScript side, which is the same thing, right? So then when you, when you compile that in over here, it, when, when you, that goes in a switch so that, so that when you link it into that application that uses that, it will run an ActionScript emulation of your jQuery button. And then when it gets cross-compiled, we will actually, it's expecting some JS to get plugged in. It's gonna plug in the code that wraps that, that uh, jQuery pattern, right? So it's more, it's more, more like injecting jQuery via JavaScript. It's not, you're not gonna look at the HTML file and see all that stuff set up. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. But we need people to help us build out that jQuery library, right? And a, and a you know, library for bootstrap and, you know, top coat, and, you know, whatever people want to use. But you'll be able, to, the key thing here is, is the glue, right? The key thing that kills you a lot of times is the glue code. You can use all these widgets, then you gotta write your own code in between, right? Well, if that glue code is being written in a, in a real structured class type language, you're gonna make fewer mistakes. When you finally get to run, it's gonna run, right? And so I think uh, that's, that's sort of the, the, the thing that's gonna make or break, I think, FlexJS. Any other questions? Okay. You, you said that the embedding's not gonna work, why? I don't think there's a good embedding uh, yeah. mechanism in, in the browser, right? But because uh, I just came across uh, some really, uh, when, when using Wix, uh, they actually embed uh, graphical uh, resources in HTML. So you don't, you've got embedded pictures in the JavaScript or in the yeah. HTML file. What is it, Base64 encoded data? Yeah. All right, well, if there's a way to do it, let's do it. Yeah, because I, I think if we take, uh, take away uh, things that aren't possible, uh, I think it m might, might make uh, people more comfortable with it. Yeah, no, the more we can, you know, we're starting from brand new, yeah. we're working our way backwards towards the Flex SDK, right? Right now it doesn't look, I mean, there's buttons and stuff like that, like I said, but the API is a little bit different, but someone's probably gonna sit down and write something that looks like Spark button under the same namespace, right? Spark.components.button. And they probably won't get all 124 APIs out of it, but you know, they're gonna start off with label and, and click event and disable and so on. Um, it's gonna be a, a slightly fatter, slower button, but it means that you have to do less work when you port your code, right? So you'll, but, but it'll be a trade off for you to decide, right? But you'll always know that if you, if, you, if you think those things are weighing down your app, you throw them out and you can go with a lighter weight button and get lighter weight JavaScript out the other side, right? But yeah, but if we can, but if, as we get more people involved, if we can find a way to do embedding, we'll do embedding. If we can find a way to do AMF, we're gonna do AMF, right? Because right now we're doing JSON, but there's no good AMF implementation, right? But once we can throw out IE8, I think in, we need byte array in the browsers. Once you get byte array in the browsers, we can do AMF, right? And then we can start working on that, right? So, so it's just a matter of people getting in there and saying, yep, here's how it works in the browser, here's how I'm gonna wrap it up and present it to you, uh, you know, in ActionScript so that when you glue it together, you're gonna to make fewer mistakes and be more productive. That's really what it's gonna come down to. You said there the, the source map feature, uh, so isn't that source, source map feature that you can sort of open your application in Chrome and uh, start debugging and you actually see the original code and you can start debugging? Well, this is a, it's a source map back to the JavaScript output, not to the action script. Ah, okay. Yeah, and we've, maybe if we get enough people together, we'll find a way to do all of that, right? There's some people have talked about annotating the JavaScript with the action script, right? But right now, it looks so much alike, you can kind of tell where, you, where it came from, right? But hopefully, you're not in there too much because we've got all the abstractions right, right? Most of that JavaScript code you're running, you didn't write. Right. It'd be really fun, especially if people get involved, man. <laughs> I think, you know, we've got to get an official Apache release out so we can make 
official Apache noise about it, right? There is a, a, an, a, there is a flex con conference going on in the middle of May in San Francisco or San Jose, right? And so um, I'm, pr I'm very hopeful we'll have the official release out before then so that people who want to come talk to me about it can come talk to me about it. You know, I'll be there for two days with nothing better to do than give one presentation and, and talk to people about this stuff. All right, well, we hope to see you guys online on the mailing list. All right, thank you. That can just go to the, uh, the Linux Foundation site to get that presentation done. Yeah, yeah. The Linux Foundation has these slides.